little communion cups and you want to participate in communion today, you got to get it now because it's time. So I'll give you a few seconds to meander over there because I don't see anything. All right. So on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took some very simple things and Use them to teach a profound lesson. This is stuff that we talked about two weeks ago when we talked about baptism and communion. This isn't something that's meant to be taken lightly. It's not to be something that is just treated as some vain ritual that we sort of limp our way through every so often. It's, it's something that preaches the gospel message that Jesus died for sinners and is coming back. In fact, the scriptures tell us that when we take communion, we're supposed to be proclaiming what the Lord has done. We're supposed to proclaim his death until he returns. Now, these the, the things inside this little package, there's nothing sacred about them. It's a flavorless little wafer made of water and flour and grape juice. Very ordinary things. But they're symbols of some very profound things. The body and the blood of Jesus Christ, broken and shed for the sins of the world. So with that in mind, my encouragement to you would be this. As a church, we believe that communion is for anybody that has professed faith in Jesus Christ. Um, but only for people that have professed faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so I would encourage you that if you don't know the Lord, just... Don't participate. Let it, let it pass you by. No, no harm, no foul. But if you are a believer, in these moments, would you allow God to search your heart, reveal any secret sin that you may have sort of compartmentalized and made yourself comfortable with? Do business with the Lord. And then, partake, celebrating what Jesus has done to forgive you, to make you the also the other element of this is that it's to be done together. It's, it's a it's a community activity. It's something that we share in. It's a meal of, of, of sorts that we have fellowship in. So we also are mindful that this is something that unites us together in purpose to proclaim the gospel message until the Lord returns. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God in heaven, in these moments, we pray that you would search our hearts. And as we just sort of are still before you, you would make known to us things in our lives that don't please you. Maybe it's actions, patterns. Maybe it's just attitudes that are inconsistent with our testimony as believers. Lord, we thank you for the cross where you died so that we could be washed and made new and forgiven of these things. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship that we have as a church. We can come together and participate in this. Lord, would you use it to unite us in purpose in proclaiming your truth to a lost and dying world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You take that little paper on the top. There's a clear part. You sort of want to peel that away from the, I don't know, pink thing. Pull that out. And we'll wait for each other on that. Just sort of hold that up so I know you've got that ready. Representative of the body of Jesus Christ, broken for you. Take it Lord, we do thank you that you went to the cross for us, that you experienced the full weight of the wrath of the Almighty due for our sin, and you took it upon yourself so that we could have life. But we don't take that lightly. We praise you for it. Amen. The scriptures say that in like manner he took the cup, gave it to his disciples, blessed it, said, do this in remembrance of me. The blood is, of course, signifying 
the blood of the Passover lamb that was shed and, and, and spread over the doorposts of the children of Israel in the life the Lord delivered them from slavery in Egypt. As Christians, we believe that we've been delivered from the slavery, the slavery and bondage that we're into our sin. And it's by that same blood that's been shed, the blood of Jesus Christ. And so with that, we'll peel that little pink thing off the top, and we'll partake in that together. Representative of the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for you and for me. Take and drink. Lord God, we thank you that we can be washed and made new. Not by our effort, not by our works, not by our merit, not by enough religious activity, not by membership in the right church, but by your blood, Jesus. You're the only one qualified to be our Savior. And you are a mighty one. Lord, I thank you that there is no sin so great that you can't forgive it. Lord, I also am mindful that there is no person so good that isn't in need of it. So Lord, we thank you that salvation is available to any and all who will turn from their sin and trust you as Savior. Amen. All right. Go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew chapter 16. That's where we're going to be this morning. Matthew 16. We're going to move through a different number of different passages, but that's where we're going to start as we publicly declare the Word of God. Uh, the idea is that we would be transformed by the working of the Holy Spirit, that we would represent well our Savior in the world that we find ourselves in. Matthew chapter 16, 16 through 18, it says this. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What a powerful statement. You know, this year, this last year, I guess carried over into this year, there's been a lot of things that have come against the church in one sense. The, the church global, the, the big church. Lots of different ways of gathering and meeting and figuring out online stuff and for our purposes, building a new building and having church outside. I'm really encouraged that none of those things that threatened churches that we were forced to respond to were ever really a threat because we have on the authority of Jesus Christ that even the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that Jesus has built. It's that same Peter that Jesus is speaking to, who wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, that we should always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in us. We should not only know what we believe, but why we believe it. And so as we continue this series of messages where we've looked at our statement of faith, or the what of our faith, and then we've looked deeply into Scripture to see why we believe those things, we come to what our statement of faith says on the church. Now something's going on in the culture today, and it's becoming more common. People claim to love Jesus while they're apathetic toward the church. People claim to be Christians, but have no association with other Christians. In our culture, the, world, the word church brings to mind steeples, rather than people. It brings to mind buildings, rather than families. It brings to mind social events, rather than life in community with others. But we believe in the church, and we value the church. 
And we ought to be able to correct those misunderstandings because we recognize that the church was established by Christ and that the church is near and dear to the heart of the Savior. We understand the purpose of the church, that it's the God-ordained vehicle for worship, evangelism, and discipleship in the world today. You know what you don't really hear in church often? Here's three things, sort of funny. You never hear, I love singing new hymns I've never heard before. You never hear, hey, it's my turn to sit in the front row. You never hear, Pastor, I was so interested that I didn't even notice that your sermon went 25 minutes extra. You never hear those things. My friends, the reality is, is that the church is not a building with benches. It's not a common interest social club. It's not an entertainment venue. Church isn't just a meeting on Sunday mornings. And if the past 10 months haven't taught us that, I doubt we'll ever learn. We've met inside, we've met outside. We've met here, we've met in homes. All summer we actually met under an ag shelter built for cattle. <laughs> See, the church is more about people than pews. It's a body, not a building. The church is a people who assemble and cooperate in glorifying God and making disciples. So we, the church, have answers to the difficult questions that people are wrestling with in the world. And we have remedies for their hurts. And despite what the government might say, the church is essential. Our statement of faith lays out very nicely a biblical definition of the church. It says this. We believe that the church of Jesus Christ is composed solely of those who have been redeemed and washed in His blood, regenerated and sealed by the Holy Spirit, and that they are saved to worship and to serve. That it is the responsibility and privilege of all who are saved to seek throughout the world to win others to Christ, that they should seek to live holy lives, yielding themselves to God and forsaking all that might dishonor Him. If you consider this to be your church home, understand that that is what we believe about the church. Living holy lives and pointing others to Jesus is what it means to be part of the church. And this morning we're going to look at three attributes of the church as the Bible describes it to sort of aid that understanding and to help us grab hold of that as we go out from this place into the community. Fair enough? That's where we are today. First we see from Matthew chapter 16, what we just read, that the church is a united body. We read of Christ identifying a few characteristics of the church as he speaks to Peter. Peter rightly identifies that Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus says, that is the rock that my church is built on. That statement, that simple faith, that simple recognition that Jesus is, is the Messiah, Jesus says, that truth is the rock that my church will be built on. But notice that he doesn't say, that truth is the rock my churches will be built on. How many churches does Jesus have? But we have multiple churches even in our small town, don't we? In many communities, you'll find Baptists and Methodists and Assemblies of God and Pentecostals and Lutherans and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and, I mean, <clears throat> the list is longer than the names of the animals at the zoo. In a bigger town, you might have a first or second of each one of these different churches. How would you like to be the 16th Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas? Will you imagine the smug people at the 15th always looking down on them? You know, we were here before you. <laughs> Jesus didn't say to Peter, to Peter, on this rock I'll build my churches, did he? He says, on this one truth, I'll build my one church. And from then and there on, there has been one church with one foundation. So why all the different names and why all the different denominations and why all the different buildings? Well, beyond the reality that we're called to separate from those who teach things that are contrary to the Word of God, in critical areas of doctrine, we need to acknowledge that the church is a united body. We believe in the church universal, a spiritual body living 
for Christ, of which Christ is the head, and all born-again people of all of the world throughout all of time are members. The church is universal. So what is the, univer the universal church? It's people from all the world throughout all of history who have trusted in the Messiah as their Savior. Ephesians 2, 19-22 says it very well. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple, in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. This is why you and I can say of Christians gathering together in Africa this morning, he's my brother, he's my sister. This is why we should weep for and pray for and serve Christians who are being persecuted all around the world. There's actually research that makes a compelling argument that in the last 21 years, more Christians have been killed for their faith than in the prior 2,000 years of human history combined. Catch that. In the last 21 years, more Christians have been killed as martyrs than in the prior 2,000 years of human history combined. We just don't experience it in the United States of America and are ignorant of that reality. We should be tremendously thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. Because all around the world, believers are dying for what we're enjoying this morning. Perhaps that might change your outlook a little bit. There are Christians all around the world who are dying to do what we're doing right now. Literally risking their lives to do what we are doing right now. Yet in this country we treat church like it's optional and then we get mad when the governor treats the church like it's optional. Because the church is one united body, because the church is universal, it should grieve us to hear of believers being persecuted around the world. Paul says these people are not only fellow citizens of the kingdom of God, but they're members of our family. They're part of the household of God. Let me under, just put this in your mind really quick. If your brother or your sister were in a far off country facing death, would it stir something in your soul? The reality is, your brothers and your sisters are facing death right now as part of the universal church being persecuted, being martyred. And it should stir something in our soul. And maybe, maybe just real simply, it stirs us not to take the freedom that we have to gather, to worship, to study the word. We take it for granted. By show of hands, how many of you own one Bible? At least one Bible. How many people have a whole shelf of Bibles in different translations? Got it on your phone? Commentaries. Greek, Greek and Hebrew lexicons. Bible study tools. Helps. Websites that tell you how to interpret difficult passages. We have access to all of this. Christians in China get killed for owning this. One of them. So you know what they do? They share it. They memorize it. And then they get put in prison. And then they're in prison and they're beaten for having a, a, a Bible. Somebody brings them a little slip of paper. And they memorize it. Because then they get beaten and it gets confiscated. And you know what they say? That's why we memorize it quickly. But we take our Bible. We set it in our nightstand, and it collects dust, and we treat these things like they're optional. What are we missing? 
What are we missing in the United States of America where we will take the things of God that people all around the world are willing to die for and treat them as though they're equal as important as visiting Chuck E. Cheese? Sorry. If your brother were in a far off land facing death, it would stir something in your soul. And when you read the Bible, you read stories of Christians long ago, it should stir something in your soul in the same way. Because the universal church just isn't just spanning the globe. It has one foundation, it has one class of apostles and prophets and one cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you read of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you read the history of your spiritual family. And when you read of the apostles and you read of the early church fathers, you read of your spiritual lineage. And when you read of Esther and Ruth and Mary and Martha and Priscilla and the daughters of Philip, you read about your sisters in Christ. John 1.12 but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. While not everybody who calls himself a Christian is actually a Christian, every person ever who's been born again by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ is adopted into the family of God, and they are one universal body of believers from every tribe, every nation, and every language throughout all time. That's what we mean when we say we believe in the universe the church. Now, I've been told that I have a big family. And when I catch myself reading the fine print on the kids eat free offers at IHOP, I think it might be true. I mean, we can feel the baseball team without even inviting the neighbor kids, okay? But beyond that, beyond your immediate family, you have your extended family, right? You've got cousins and aunts and uncles and grandmas and... That's all family too, right? And we love them. They're our family. And we're connected to them. But we don't see them every day. That's how extended family works. That's how we should think about the universal church. We love them. And we're connected to them. And we'll pray for them. And we'll serve their needs. And we'll visit them on occasion. But they're not people that we associate with every day. Like the people that we live with in our home. So the universal church is the extended family. The immediate family is the local church. The church is universal. The church is also local. This is a concept that's recognized in Scripture as well. Even in one region, there may be multiple local churches. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, saying in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13-14, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. But you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. Notice one region, one Judea, Yet multiple local congregations, churches, plural. The Greek word translated here as churches is the plural form of the word ekklesia. It could just as well be translated as an assembly or a gathering. It's the literal coming together of what the Bible describes as called out once. It's people... God has separated from the world by salvation in Jesus Christ, who he then commands to assemble, to worship Christ, and to meet the needs of others, and to make Christ known. That's what a church is. That's what a local congregation is. You see, we can't gather with Christians in China, at least not with any regularity. We can't gather with Christians in Africa every Sunday. Yes, they're part of us universally as extended family, but they're not part of us locally. The church's people 
who profess faith in Jesus Christ, who choose to associate, I'm talking about the local church here, people who profess faith in Jesus Christ, who choose to associate with each other for worship. It's an immediate family that you see every day where the universal church is an extended family that you see on special occasions. The church is one united body where all blood relatives having been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Go ahead and flip in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Go ahead and turn there. It will be helpful to you. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. It says this. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing by the word. That he might present to her himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Pause for just one second. Excuse me. Please. Spring-like days are tough on the allergies, aren't they? I know. <laughs> Hold now, on me, Frank. No, I've got some. I'm just kidding. Often this passage that I just read is preached in the context of marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Be sacrificed for it. It's, it's absolutely true and applicable for marriage. It specifically says, husbands, do this. But, before we start making jokes about how men can start sacrificing for their wives by deciding not to watch the Super Bowl and surrender the remote control so she can watch something else, we should understand that this passage is primarily about the church. Verse 32 of the same chapter says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So whatever is taught here about marriage is first about the Lord and His church. You see, the church is a redeemed body. Christ loves the church, sacrifices Himself for the church, cleanses the people of the church, and makes the church holy. What do we see here other than redemption? The church is a universal body. It's universal, it's local, it's united. But it's also a redeemed body. The church here is likened to a woman in need of rescue. And before any of your feminist sensitivities are bruised, I'll say that this is a metaphor that describes all people prior to them knowing Christ, men included. And it begins with Christ loving these people. Look what he says. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loves the church. He gave himself to redeem the church. The spiritual condition of, of the people that make up the church prior to their knowing Christ is that they're people in need of redemption. We are people in need of washing. And Jesus gathers us and washes us and He removes our sin and He removes our spot and He removes our blemish and He makes us holy and He makes us radiant. And then if we keep reading, He nourishes the church and cherishes the church and loves the church. Tell me, does the church matter to Jesus? A lot, doesn't it? In fact, you might say the church matters to Jesus as much as a bride matters to a loving husband. To be the church is to be identified as a person redeemed by the work of Christ who died on a Roman cross to pay the penalty of sin and to remove its stain. 
The reality is, is that even the blackest of souls can be washed and made new and made holy by the one Christ who shed his blood on the cross. Our statement of faith says that the church is composed solely of those who have been redeemed. And that redemption is only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, that great against the postmodern mindset that says there's multiple paths to salvation. Yes, that makes salvation exclusive to those who turn from their sin and follow Christ. But that exclusivity is nothing that should make us arrogant or judgmental. We're saved by grace through faith, not works. So all boasting is eliminated. It's precluded. My friends, this is simply what the Bible teaches. But I want to get to the heart of the issue here. Because we are the church. We represent Christ in the community. We are those called out ones. We are the redeemed. And how we represent Jesus is of eternal significance. How are we to represent Jesus who loved the church enough to die if we aren't willing to love the church enough to faithfully participate in the life of the church? And y'all are here, so I'm preaching to the choir, aren't I? Here's the, here's, here's the reality. If the church matters a lot to Jesus, it should matter a lot to us. Now, I'm not denying that people get hurt by the church. Okay? Anybody ever been wounded by church? Yeah. It happens. I'm not denying that churches are filled with hypocrisy. Anybody ever met a hypocrite in church? <laughs> Anybody ever been a hypocrite in church? I would even acknowledge that there may be scenarios where a person can't be part of a local church. For example, Paul, while he was in prison. Tough for him to be part of a local church, he's in jail. But the idea of a person who calls themselves a Christian and then thinks that they can treat the church like it's optional is a rejection of the entire assumption of the New Testament concerning Christ and the church. Period. No, no explanation, no excuse, that's it. To, to treat church as it's optional for a Christian is a rejection of the entirety of the New Testament. The, identity, the, the idea that we can identify with Christ but not serve as ambassadors for his kingdom is a rejection of the very words of Jesus. The Bible assumes that we'll be assembling with other believers regularly. That we, under the leadership of elders and pastors, would be equipped and encouraged and held accountable to use our gifts in service to the Lord that we might help other people find and follow Christ. That is the assumption of the entirety of the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, 1-5. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Years back, Cynthia and I and our children lived in a city with 500,000 people. In the four miles between our home and our church building, we would pass at least four other churches. Not one of those churches had outgrown its building. Yet in our consumer culture, perhaps we make absolutes out of things that the Lord says are preferences, and worse, sometimes we make preferences over things that the Lord says are absolutes, and we can't simply bear with others in love and remain united, and so we break away and build different buildings and call ourselves something different when the Lord has called us to unity in Him. But that's 
the consumer mindset of the United States of America. And so we have con consumer Christianity. I think it's worth saying that there are circumstances that may, that may make fellowship with particular people difficult. Okay, that's reality. But I think those circumstances are far less common than it seems we make them. God has called the local church, the redeemed people, in a community, to serve together in that community, to reach the lost, and to remain in God-honoring fellowship with each other. Now, that reach should eventually go beyond that community and the neighboring communities and eventually around the world. But that is what the Bible describes as a church. Let me say this. The Bible is crystal clear. A person that says, I love Jesus but can't stand the church, they don't love Jesus. Period. I can prove it to you. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. Did you catch that? How do you know you pass from death to life? How do you know you're saved? You love the church. How do we know that we know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren? He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Pretty clear? You can't say, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. It doesn't work that way. Because the church is a body of redeemed people, it's a body of people that understand forgiveness, and they understand unconditional love. It's a family that's going to stick together no matter what, and so they learn to keep short accounts, and they learn to forgive, and they learn to bear with each other in love. It's people that understand that there's too much work to be done in reaching the lost than to waste time squabbling over petty differences. But still, we can think of all sorts of reasons that people might make up to not be part of the church, right? What if I've been hurt by the church? Is that a good reason? Maybe forgive as Christ forgives and love the church? What if the church is messed up? Get to work healing and repairing what's broken. What if I feel more connected to God in nature? Well, we're meeting outside. But what if this, that, or the other? Know this. I'm not discounting, discounting that there are real circumstances that make this sort of unity, despite hurt, Difficult. I get it. There's real things that make it hard. And yes, there are false movements and so-called churches that we should separate from. But in most cases, if you're not dying or in prison, or there isn't something making it impossible for you to be part of a local body of believers, then there isn't a valid biblical reason for you not to die to self, bear with one another in love, and obey the commands of Scripture for your personal and corporate edification, growth in the Lord. In order that God would be glorified because you are redeemed and you can't love God and not love the church. And so when I say go to church, I don't mean drive to this building. I mean gather with other believers and exhort each other in the word and be in each other's homes and be in each other's lives between Sundays. Get together for a meal and enjoy life together. And yes, be connected when we gather here for Bible study and prayer and praise. Notice that the passage that we read from Ephesians 5 says Christ loves the church. The Bible teaches that every Christian is adopted into the family of God. And so I'll make this parallel. If you said to me, Dan, I really love you, but I can't stand your wife, rest assured we're not friends. I, I'm serious. I may still like you, and I still may be fond of you, and I still may want to have a relationship with you and to see that hurt. It doesn't mean I'm going to, like, you know, TP your house or something. But if you say you like me, but you can't stand my wife, we're not friends. Now, reality is, is that's an analogy, because if you're going to find one of us to not like, it's going to be me, because she's, you know, really likable and kind, and I'm sort of, you know, bull in a china shop sometimes. My wife 
Cynthia and I are united. We're a package deal. That's the comparison that's used here to inform our thinking in, in, in the passage we read in Ephesians 5. It's a marriage. It's a husband and his wife. They're united. They're one. They're a package deal. If you're going to get to know me, you're going to get to know her. And if you're going to get to know her, you're going to have to get to know me because we come together. If you know Christ, you're going to come to know the church. And if you're going to interact with people that are part of the church, eventually you're going to come to know Christ. If they're a living, active, vibrant, gospel-proclaiming body of believers because Christ and his church are one. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The church is a universal body. It's a redeemed body. It's a working body. Matthew 28, 18-20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is Christ speaking to the disciples just before He ascended. He'd established the church, the very foundation of it, and He's entrusting it into these people who, being filled with the Holy Spirit, would carry the gospel throughout the known world. Now, we have to understand something. The imperative command here is not go. It's not get on a ship and go to China. It's make disciples. That's what he's commanding us to do. Make disciples. Whether you're coming or going, whether you're here or there, the church is to be about disciple making. Going is implied. It's a as you go, as you live out your life, make disciples. The church is to be a working body. Our statement of faith says that Christians are saved to worship and to serve. And that it's the responsibility and privilege of all who are saved to seek throughout the world to win others to Christ. Matthew 22, 36-40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Look on the front of your bulletin. Everybody catch your bulletin? Go to the very front page. Right under the date. What does it say? Four words. Say them out loud. Glorify God and make disciples. Glorify God. Make disciples. Those are the words that are written there. They're on our bulletin. They're on our website. They're on our letterhead. And I hope those words become etched into your hearts and minds as well. The church, that's a working body, exists to glorify God and make disciples. The basis of this phrase, glorify God, is right here in this passage. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Glorifying God is the gathering together for public worship. It's associating together to praise the Lord. It's gathering to hear the word and live it out. After all, Christ said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's bringing everything in our lives, from our work, to our families, and to our hobbies, into obedience to the Lord who died to save us, that we would honor Him in all we do. The reality is, is that we need each other for that. The working church is a God-glorifying church. It's also a disciple-making church. Matthew 28, you read the Great Commission. Jesus commands us to go make disciples. It's reaching out into the community as a body. It's sharing our faith in our daily lives. It's living on mission with God to reach the lost in Stony Fork, in the Doga, in Elk Creek, in Leesville, in Calusa County, to the ends of the earth. Understand this. The local church, each local church, is the deployment center for world missions. Stony Ford Community Church, yeah, little bitty Stony Ford Community Church, you 
are the deployment center for world missions. That's who you are, according to the Word of God. That means sharing the gospel isn't just my job. It's the job of every Christian. Jesus told his disciples to make disciples. And those disciples were to teach others everything that Jesus commanded. They were to teach others to obey what Jesus said. In other words, Jesus is commanding that we make disciples who make disciples. Who make disciples, and then those ones would make disciples. And There's no process we need to implement. Church growth is a simple thing. There's no fancy campaign, no 40-day program we need to download. A growing church is a working church. It's a working body. It's a church of disciples who make disciples. You are the church growth plan. You sharing Christ with your friends and neighbors is how the church grows. It's how the kingdom of God grows. You modeling Christ-likeness and biblical living for those you lead to the Lord is the plan. It's been said that the church is the greatest community on the planet. It takes people of all sizes and shapes and colors and political views and it puts them together under one name, the name of Jesus. It doesn't discriminate on the basis of race or economic status or having the right social graces. The church unites people under one flag and one cause and it gives and it sacrifices for each other like family. Even for people we've never actually met. The church is the representative body of Jesus Christ on the earth today. It's a united body. It's a redeemed body. It's a local body. It's the ultimate community. And the saddest thing in the world is that not everyone is part of it. They can be, but they're not. So with that, perhaps a few points of application are helpful. One, be connected to Christ. To be part of the church, you must first be connected to Christ. And I'm not talking about attending. I mean really being part of the family. You can't buy or work your way into the ultimate community because you can't pay the membership dues. You can't afford it. The price has to be paid by the founder of the organization. His name is Jesus. 2,000 years ago on Calvary, he paid for you. You see, all people are sinful. The Bible says there's no one righteous. Because of our sin, we're separated from the goodness of God and we're condemned under the wrath of God. But God, in His love, added flesh to His divine nature and He became a man. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. And they laid down that life, dying by crucifixion at the hands of Roman executioners. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin. And three days later, he rose to life again, and he says that life, the eternal life that he offers you, is offered freely to everyone who will turn from their sin and trust in him as Savior. So today, by way of application, be connected to Christ. Don't put that off. Turn from your sin. Trust Christ and follow him. Second point of application, be connected to other Christians. To grow in our life in Christ, to know what it looks like to live for the Lord, you will need other Christians in your life. You will need a church family. You will need someone to walk with you as you walk that narrow road that we talked about a few weeks back. You need the body of Christ, the local and universal church, to come alongside you and to teach you and to hold you accountable and to encourage you. The reality is, is they also need you. You will need a people and a place to begin to understand your unique spiritual gifts so that you can serve the Lord as He's called you. Understand that I'm not saying you can't be a Christian and not be part of a church. That's not what I'm saying at all. Salvation 
is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Church affiliation is not a requirement for salvation. But, you will not find one example anywhere in the Bible of a healthy, vibrant, growing Christian who's willingly disconnected from a local body of believers. You will not find it anywhere in, anywhere in the Bible. It's not there. So be connected to other Christians. Not just on Sunday, but on Monday, and on Tuesday, and on every day that ends in Y. Be in each other's lives and exhort and encourage and provide accountability for each other as we grow in learning to live like Jesus. You see, too often in the modern church movement we treat salvation like it's the finish line. We just want to get people to say a prayer and to raise their hand and to, and to get them to believe the salvation message. Yeah, we do. We want people to be saved. But understand that that is the starting line, not the finish line. finish line is seeing each of us grow in Christ's likeness. And that growth happens in relationships where discipleship takes place. It requires more than sitting here on Sunday morning listening to me. It requires the richness and the warmth of the Christian fellowship that we read about in Scripture where we bear with each other in grace and humility and hold each other accountable requires a willingness to sacrificially love others and to meet their needs and be there for them even when they're wrong. It requires the kind of Christian fellowship that we read about often but don't practice very much. To put it simply, we need each other. My friends, this is powerful. If we would grab a hold of that. Being connected to other believers is absolutely vital to your growth and health as a believer, even more than preaching. Third point of application, be committed to the cause. This is our cause. Glorify God, make disciples. That's why we exist. So live in a God-honoring way and gather for public worship and live in private worship. Work for the glory of God. Serve for the glory of God. Parent for the glory of God. Love your spouse sacrificially. Why? For the glory of God. And make disciples. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People need to hear of who Jesus is. It's our job as a body of Christ to make Christ known. So my challenge to you is this. Who will you tell about Jesus? Let's close in a word of prayer. God Almighty, you have called us into something mighty. You've called us into something powerful, something unique, something that the world can't even really understand. Lord, the church that you've established does something that Every government, every politician, every movement, every community, activism, organization has failed to do. Unite people. People of every background, every status, every race, and made them one. Lord, we're thankful this morning that there are believers all around the world gathering to worship you, that they are our spiritual family. Lord, we thank you that we get to gather here this morning as a local family and that you provided a, a house for us, a place that we can gather. Lord, help us to see this, this place as our home away from home where our family meets. Lord, help us to bear with each other in love to forgive and to hold each other up in prayer. Hold each other up to the standard of your word. Help us to be faithful to proclaim the gospel message to those who don't know you. Lord, unite us. Not just in showing up on Sunday, but in living our lives together in community. 
Lord, help us to bring you glory, to make disciples that follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.